the impossible conversation. In a post-truth world, we need a safe place to have conversations about things that really matter. In the business-as-usual world, we just can't talk about the insanity that's now called normal. And we don't talk about our core disconnection from the web of life. The impossible conversation, where we can come together to fully feel what we're going through and discern the sober reality of the world around us. The impossible conversation where we can set our sights on fully reconnecting with our deeper, wiser selves, others, and earth. The impossible conversation where thought and activist leaders can explore new ways of being in the face of our global predicaments. The impossible conversation. Welcome to this safe circle. In this episode of the Impossible Conversation podcast, the tables get turned and I am interviewed by Hambone Littletail. Hi guys, it is an absolutely gorgeous day here in paradise in the end times. I am actually in Mendocino County, California right now on this beautiful Monday afternoon, July 24th, 2017. But more importantly, I am on the phone to, I believe, Medford, Oregon with my new buddy and Alert Tribes member, Dean Walker. Dean Walker, I think you can see Dean on the screen. And if you've been listening to my rants for the past week or so, you've heard me already share two readings from Dean Walker's brand new, hot off the press book, The Impossible Conversation, Choosing Reconnection and Resilience at the End of Business as Usual. There's that great book. I urge you to get a copy from Amazon.com. So, I admit, guys, I don't know much about Dean Walker. And he's a great guy. He's a good writer. And his new book, The Impossible Conversation, uh, is a must-read for everybody. But uh, I'm just going to let Dean introduce himself to the tribe, and then we're just going to dive into a conversation. So, Dean, say hi to the guys and tell us how you got down this rabbit hole and found yourself on Humpty Dumpty Tribe. Yeah. Well, Hambo, thanks so much for having me on. I got to tell you, I listened to your uh, Sunday sermon that included uh, chapter four, I believe it was, from from my book, and I had never heard anybody read from my uh, my book, uh, The Impossible Conversation, and and you did a beautiful job of it, and and because you were so. Uh, well versed in the issues going on, none of it was new, and so you had this nuance that you could add to it, these emphases that you could add to it. You know your usual emphasis that you put on stuff, and I just got to say it, it was uh, it was really moving to have you um, you know bring your skills at reading, and um, whoever the author was, wow, I'm, I am impressed. You know? <laughs> well, I uh, I'm glad to be part of the impossible conversation that I've been, I've been trying to have for seven years here on Humble yeah, County Drive. I know so, you have. So tell us a little bit. So uh, it you you are not a as I am not like any sort of trained ecologist, climatologist, biologist, paleontologist. You were just kind of a, a, a regular guy, I understand, a few years ago, and that just stumbled into this information. Is is, is that correct? How would you explain yeah, that? It's, it's pretty safe to say. You know, I guess I should start way back when, you know, I've, I've always had a love of the ocean. I grew up in San Diego, and... Um, I uh, loved Jacques Cousteau. I mentioned that in the book quite a bit. You know, really, that was anchored me to the earth in a, at a time when my family life was just horrid. And um, so I could go to the ocean and, and find a lot of healing and, and solace. And uh, ever since, that's, you know, the ocean's where I go to recharge my inner batteries. And I've always cared about the environment a tremendous amount. And I've always known since watching Jacques Cousteau so many years ago, 
you know, part of his message in every episode was how we're messing things up. Mm-hmm. It was was that the human impact on the earth was uh, serious and to be taken very seriously. And he was, you know, recommending and, and imploring for change. And of course, none happened except for the acceleration and intensification of that footprint and that impact of, for years and years and years. And just to, to call one on myself, you know, what I've spent most of my adult life doing in my career is doing designing and delivering trainings for people in different of different kinds, working with a lot of corporate groups, a lot of personal development work, uh, working with intimacy with couples, you know, uh, training adults to work with at-risk youth, you know, that kind of stuff. And of, of all of those... Um, the corporate stuff was always the hardest because really in my heart of hearts, I could always hear Jacques Cousteau in the background if, as if he could talk over my shoulder saying, you know, this what the, this work you're doing with GM or GM Canada <laughs> is really just having them build more cars, make more profit, and do more extraction from this planet, and it's damaging the planet. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the looking, that kind of inner work, of looking and telling the truth, doing kind of a personal inventory of how I've been complicit in my own way in this human uh, operating system that's become pretty much ecocidal. Um, I, I just, as I did stumble into about two and a half years ago now, um, you know how I how I just uh, was exposed to abrupt climate change. Um, so you, then this I, is I, just two, two, you've, you've only been down this rabbit hole for two and a half years. I, I must say you've made great progress. Yeah, yeah well, I, I'll tell you, I, uh, I went to a guy McPherson talk. I was asked to do some video work for him and help him out with a couple of other things. And, and uh, at the end of the weekend uh, where he did his presentation, I knew that I just had to vet this material. You mm-hmm. know, I couldn't just take it uh, on faith because this is either, as we all know, this is either the wildest, craziest uh, bullshit that's ever come down the pike, or this is truly the transformation of humanity. Now, of course, whether we like it or not. 99% and, uh, of people on the planet would, would say it's the first, and. Uh... In which I assume is between the lines of your title, The Impossible Conversation, uh, but obviously you do not think it's bullshit. You think it is it, it is a, a critical moment in the evolution of humanity is that, that we're in right now as we're speaking. Would you concur with that? Absolutely. You know, there's, it was a few months into my, you know, what I basically did was commit myself to becoming somewhat facile, somewhat conversant with the whole thing. I don't consider myself some climate scientist or expert, but I'm conversant, and I'm, I was certainly learned enough to vet the material. And uh, on the day, I remember the day that I got to the aha point, I literally, my jaw dropped, and I realized, you know, holy shit, I, this is changing my life. Now, I've never, ever been a religious person. I have a lot of a lot of um, axe to grind with, religion. <laughs> but I've had an awful lot of talks with people who uh, are deeply religious, and they, they can talk about the kind of conversion experience where they feel born again. And in some ways, I, I think my experience might be similar to that because my heart just cracked wide open. And um, there's this deep well of grief that I believe is really a shared well of grief for all of us on the planet. But most of us in the the United States and in the developed world, we just don't run the human operating system to be open-hearted. Part of what makes it work is we learn to override all the sensitivities we have in our heart that something's wrong. So we disconnect with, with our own hearts and our own sensitivities. We disconnect from other people and other beings, and we disconnect from Earth herself. And uh, so when my heart cracked open on that day, I just realized, oh my gosh, you know, this, 
this means that this this long history of us being disconnected and overriding is actually killing us and killing up to 200 species a day and more. So what what was, I mean, was there an act, what was the straw that broke your camel's back? I mean, was it a particular fact that, or is it just a, the accumulation and all of a sudden the, you... Yeah, you, well, I, I, I appreciate you asking that because I, I tried to structure the book sort of similar to the process I went through. And, you know, of course, I started with the usual parts per million of, of uh, CO2 and, and the methane and the positive feedback loops and all the things that are very familiar to all your listeners. But to tell you the truth, I got out of that as quickly as I could because that's the realm where the deniers live. Yeah, it is. And oh, I, boy. I got to say that the denier conversation, I, I did not respect it when I started this, and I loathe it now. I, I'm having a hard time finding any compassion whatsoever for that cynical borderline evil conversation that is self-serving but and i won't go on but you get the idea so what i did in i think it's chapter three is i i let people know so if i wasn't looking at the usual metrics the usual way we measure this whole conversation about climate change and the, you know that how in, how urgent is it and blah 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 I went to other metrics, and as I just mentioned, the the ocean is so important to me. But I started first there, and I started to look at other non-climate related, mm -hmm. but not directly most yeah, of it, right. um, other metrics. And, you know, just look at one of the first, I, I think there's like 40 items by the time you get done with that chapter that I list out. And one easy to point at is that every one of our global fisheries, all the areas where, they, where human beings do fisheries on in the oceans around the world, are uh, scheduled to be collapsed by 2040 if we continue on with business as usual consumption and extraction. I'm just curious, do you, now, eat, do you eat seafood? Well, right now I have cut way way back okay just, i might have checking. three or four meals of seafood a year now yeah yeah after having come to this this you know choice point and information point but you get a sense of that if you know um just hearing that and that there's no billion dollar denial industry built up as there is in the climate conversation all there is is this kind of crickets playing silence in the background, mm -hmm. when you say that kind of a statistic, you know, are there a couple of nonprofits out there trying to change things with how we do these gigantic nets and and uh, the wasteful way that we uh, we do fishing on this planet and and truly the ecocidal way we do it? And it's it's just there's nothing being done, nothing of consequence. And I could go on and on through item after item well let's just but, boil yeah. it down because i say i want to I, I want to move our our impossible conversation on 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 our reaction to it so so give me your 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 three to five minutes uh, summation on the state of planet earth in late july 2017 where where are we at, literally as a species and as a planet how far up to the brick wall or the bottom of the cliff, whatever term you want to use, are we, in your opinion? Yeah. Well, what I'd like to do, uh, Hambone, is, is just mention a little bit about, uh, you've, you've already been kind enough to kind of mention for us that Carolyn Baker and I are putting together a couple of workshops this year, piloting a, an offering of a workshop, a safe place where people can do this kind of conversation and this kind of deep inner looking at, at, you know, who will we be in the face of these predicaments? And it, to answer the, your question right now, um, again, I'm just talking about what I set the book up to do. There's some exercises I ask people to do. One of them, the first, one of the first ones is for people to look at um, 
the information that I lay out in the chapters and ask them to do what I did, which is once you get conversant, once you get familiar with what's going on and, and some of the reports and some of the statistics, position yourself on a, on a timeline between now and 2100, and, you know, when will these collapse episodes occur? And, of course, we're making stuff up, but, but we're doing it now with some amount of information yeah. and access to be able to get more. Because all we ever do, every day, all day, all of us, just make shit up. And we make shit up usually with not much in the way of statistics or, or vetted facts and so on or research. So um, when I do that, I, you know, I, I think all of your listeners and you certainly you know and I know that um, there's a range of projections from everybody from Guy Furston and, and a few other folks at roughly nine years from now being at uh, upwards of 10 degrees C and more of the baseline to the most conservative estimate on the planet that's solid as a rock is four to six degrees C from the IPCC. And my point in the book when I mention that range is, look, even if you've taken the most conservative possible route, that's assuming that we're going to be at five, four, five, six degrees C above baseline at an average temperature around the planet. The plants we use to eat on this planet cannot keep up. Yeah. We will have billions of people dying. There's just no polite way to say it. I'm tired. I'm sick to death of the polite ways to say it because anything politer than that is bullshit. You know my. You know the way I say it. Uh, so uh, well, let me say it. Are 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 we fucked? And if so, how how fucked are we uh, at this? Yeah. Point? Yeah. I mean, I'm well, talking I, I as said, as a species and as a. Not, I'm not talking individuals. Or we're gonna we're gonna work our way. Right now, yeah. uh, are we at a at the point? As I believe, uh, as a, a a as a species. I mean, not. I mean, even beyond civilization. I mean, literally as a species, uh, are we at the point of no return, uh, or are we yeah. going to turn that? I mean, species wide. Are we going to turn this train wreck around between now and the and the brick wall? Or yeah, how do you feel so, about that? How I feel about that is I I have not seen or heard one substantial encouraging article or um, statistic or report in my entire two two and a half years of doing this extensive research and, and writing this book, I, I have found nothing that, that encourages me to think that we are going to turn this around. I, I see a lot of people who like, you know, that like to use the, the common way of finishing up their, their headline on something by saying, but it's not too late if yeah. we just you know, line up <laughs> together and, and we all recycle or we all drive Priuses or something. It, it's just not there's nothing that has turned my view from a rather, you know, doom and gloom place. And I wish, God, I'd been looking, and I want it. I, I don't love this idea that we all need to die or that there needs to be mass suffering and dying and extinction. Um, what I do have some truck with, just because I haven't found an, uh, enough pieces to put together to to position myself as early as nine years, that doesn't matter. You know, to me, anything from the 2100 and four to six degrees C on back yeah. is all the same to me. Yeah, exactly. And, I, and I, as I've been actually doing a lot of research on a number of kinds of sober data. It's not just about climate. As I mentioned about oceans, and uh, you know, I do a tremendous amount of looking at the the integration of the social, um, the idea of um, what's the word I'm looking for? Gosh darn it! So we'll get to resilience in just a little while, and that's that's really you know kind of the the punchline that does offer some positives. But um, 
there's like social justice, environmental justice, economic justice issues that I believe are also intimately woven in. And I think uh, Naomi Klein and the Pope, of all people, those, those two in particular make a very, very strong argument for none of this is separable. It's all interwoven. And so, you know, that half of the American workforce right now works for $15 an hour or less with no benefits. It starts to, like, that rattles my cage every time I say it. That, that uh, the amount of people on this planet that don't have access to clean water or to, or, or, you know, through our systems of offshoring all of our production and our waste are living in the toxic pools that we didn't want to have in our own country, and we're paying them slave wages that they can't possibly live on. Wow. And all of these things are of a piece, all the way back to parts per billion of methane or million of CO2 and so on. And so, you know, to more quick, quickly answer your original question, I've got us at somewhere in the vicinity of 10 to 15 years out we have uh, a substantial amount of um, uh, temperature rise somewhere in the vicinity of four to six degrees, by certainly by 2050. And as you'll recall in the in the book, I I found all these um, statistics and all these reports. One of them from George W. Bush's um, <laughs> uh, Secretary of State getting trained up, and here they printed it up, and and it says specifically we're anticipating. Uh, four to yeah, four to five yeah. degrees Celsius by 2050. And he knew it, uh, and W knew it, and that and the whole gang knew it and knows it. So anyway, well let's 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 move our impossible conversation for it. Okay, it, it sounds like I mean up to now, and and I admit that I have I have only read through chapter six, so I have not. So this will from this point forward in the conversation is going to be brand new to me. I wanted to have time to read the whole book before this interview, but I've just been too busy with other with other things going on here in California. So. It, it it sounds like you're not really optimistic on a uh, on a species wide success rate of turning this freight train around. So let's get to what what I as I did with Carolyn. What I think you're most concerned is what do you do? What is your advice? And this will be the balance of our interview to the people first coming into this information and understanding it's not bullshit that 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 yeah. you, you know i mean it's balls to the wall here people and and no yeah. one is talking about this but for the people who are accepting this i mean what do you do J just in your yeah. own daily life not to what i say go michael rupert and, and put a 45 in 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 your mouth and pull the trigger I mean, yeah. what's, what do you do from this point forward to live with this knowledge while we're sitting around waiting for the planet to collapse? So take it away. Yeah. Dude. Well, it, you know, I, I got to put a disclaimer out in the, you know, in the first part of the answer, because you and I both know what you've just asked is, is the question. No matter how you look at this issue, these issues, these predicaments, this is, this is the question is who will we be together yeah. in the face of these predicaments? And uh, it's not like, oh, well, we know the answer. You just need to do this life hack and do these six, six things and so on. <laughs> it's, there's no simple answer nor any certain answer. But what I've had the privilege of, of putting together with Carolyn in this body of work is, you know, we've created a shared website. We're creating a, a substantial amount of, of uh, resources for people to be able to answer that, the very question you just asked, especially for people who are new to it. You know, not just the sober data part, but really starting to look at what are the skills, the inner skills and capacities that we need to build up if we're going to pretend to have any chance in the face of these really tsunami-sized waves of shared stressors 
that are going to be coming on for, at every level, yeah. at the most personal and intimate and familial level, to the community, to the state, to the country, to the globe. You know, and I, I think we can all kind of get our zombie apocalypse glasses on and see it all through that. But <laughs> And, you know, think about, oh, well, we've got to be preppers and we've got to get our 50-gallon drums of water and our guns and so on. I don't have much to say about that because I think the scale of that is so far beyond most people's capability yeah. that I, I don't I don't have much to offer that way except for what you know the the realistic scale of a person living in their town in their neighborhood and what is within their price range and so on to be able to prepare, prepare themselves in some small way that way. More, what Carolyn and I are working on is is putting together a, a, a set of offerings that if people do these practices, if people take on learning about themselves and the human condition and, and the dynamics of how we operate as beings, you know, there's a lot of wonderful wisdom that's been written about by, by the great writers and great thinkers and so on for millennia. And we draw on a lot of those. You know, maybe some of your uh, your viewers are um, familiar with Carolyn's uh, Dark Gold, her recent book about the shadow at the individual level and the collective level. And it's a serious piece of work. And I would recommend every person listening go get that book, Dark Gold by Carolyn Baker, because it, it's just this incredible compendium of the human dynamic, shadow dynamic that's in every one of us, and of course it's in us collectively. And let's just look at, at who and how uh, the country is being run right now by the administration. And it's not just one person. It's not just Donald Trump. It's really our entire culture is being acted out at the shadow level through mm -hmm. him and his administration and the uh, Republican, Democratic, the Libertarian, the, all the various permutations, it doesn't matter what flavor they are. They're all uh, immersed and saturated in shadow now. So one of the things that we're going to be working on in the workshop, the workshop that we're designing and offering live, in addition to all the online resources that we're wanting to put out there, is some basic familiarity with shadow dynamics on the individual and the collective level. And why we're doing that goes right into one of the other kind of cornerstones of the work is it, we're going to have to come together. We're going to have to get together with other people. And we're not good at that in our country. You know, at the, at the very best, we find people who think just like us, and then we kind of burrow in and have these uh, us and them relationships where everybody else is some other to be hated or judged. And we've got our own little safe, you know, relationships and enclave. And those, uh, that kind of isolation and that kind of um, kind of insulated or insular way of uh, approaching the world is just not going to work real well. Well, you so, know what you're up, yeah. you're you're not having a, a a workshop of barbecue recipe. You know what I'm saying? We're, we're, <laughs> it, it's, it, it, I mean, it's having this conversation that nobody's having, uh, yeah. and, and 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 just to know that you're shut out by by I honestly believe more than 99% of this planet including a lot of people yeah. their spouses their their children their parents their uh, best yeah. friends yeah. You, you know what I'm saying it's uh, I do. Just, it, it's that it, that whole angle of it I mean I'm looking forward to being at, at the workshop too, but you know, as I'm always, you know, the naysayers say to me, Hambone, all you're doing is preaching to the choir. Uh, oh, why bother? And I just say the world needs more preachers. But uh, yeah, address that. <clears throat> just address that whole thing about the denial from uh, and 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 just as one more thing. Uh, just just to get no support from you know from the what I call the clueless morons. How how do you yeah. handle that part of it? Yeah, 
Well, I, I can tell you I've had, a, I've had a huge number of impossible conversations with people who are not at all like me. A lot of conversations with fundamentalist Christian people, with people who are firmly in the de denier camp, and even more frustrating conversations with folks who call themselves lukewarmers, who are sort of willing to say that there's mankind has something to do with it, but it's really not a big deal, and so on. And for me, these conversations, the only doorway I, I know to offer people is to share from my heart. And again, it, I, I kind of breezed over them earlier when I mentioned them, but things like my love of the ocean or my tracking of other criteria that are not um, surrounded by and attacked constantly yeah. by the denier crowd, and to just share my concerns about the earth in those dimensions, there's it really that cuts down the the denier quotient by a huge amount. And if I if I share with people just what concerns me, and I'm not trying to convince them or change them, but I just let them know, you know, hey, I'd just like to share with you these are things that are important to me and that I'm concerned about. And I've had some pretty darn good conversations with with folks, starting with the name of my book, The Impossible Conversation, you know, I get with a denier and try and tell them, like, well, I'm going to tell you what for, and I'm going to give you all the right uh, statistics and tell you how wrong you are, and I'm going to convince you nothing's going to go anywhere. <laughs> but I tell somebody, to, you know, look, I wrote a book about the things I'm really concerned about on the planet. It's called The Impossible Conversation. And he says, yeah, what's so damn impossible about it? And off we go. Yeah. So and I don't mean to say, well, all you have to do is this, this, and this, but there are ways to open ourselves in a way that is far more human and far more heartfelt. And I believe that these are the directions to go now in well, whatever we're taking on, whatever our intention is as we move forward, whenever, wherever we position ourselves on the urgency timeline, it's time to find people that we resonate with and to get good at knowing I, I damn well better know what my stress reactions look like, what my stress behaviors look like. I better know what my capacities are and I better know how to, how to uh, be resilient in the face of massive stressors in my family and my neighborhood, my job and so on. And so these are the kinds of, exercises and practices and so on that Carolyn and I are putting together. This is the choosing reconnection and resilience part of your title. Exactly. So explain it, exactly. define, cho I know this is going to be tough in, in 10 minutes, but define choosing reconnection and resilience. What, what do those words mean? Yeah. Well, I, I didn't cover it. <clears throat> excuse me. I didn't cover it very well earlier, but I, what I found in my research time in these past couple of years, and certainly what I've seen in my years and years of working with people in in training environments, is you know basically answering the question, what got us here, and what got us here is that for a number of different reasons, we have disconnected ourselves from every primary source of meaning human meaning that we have in life. We've disconnected from our own inner heart and sensibilities, sensitivities. We've disconnected from each other, and we've disconnected from the earth. And, um, you know, I go back to jo uh, Joanna Macy is one of the really pioneers of doing work with people in exactly this field. In fact, she calls her work the work that reconnects. She saw the same cause when she asked the question, what got us here? And so that's why we have that, uh, you know, certainly why I have it so prominently, <clears throat> excuse me, in the title of the book. And um, why we couple it with the notion of resilience is, you know, 25 years ago when Joanna Macy was putting this together and it was the issue of nuclear uh, power and nuclear weapons and she was 
doing the workshops about that. Certainly there was an existential quality to it, but that was possible. Mm -hmm. And what you and I are talking about is not only probable, it's a predicament and it's going to happen. And so that brings us to the notion of resilience. Well, define resilience. Uh, I mean, against the tsunami on the on the front of your book here. I mean, how are you going to be resilient to this? I mean, yeah. obviously, uh, Michael Rupert lost his resilience. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, it is. Again, I don't want to suggest that. Oh, well, you just got to do these, you know, three easy steps and this life hack, and everything will turn out fine. But what I have discovered and what Carolyn and I are building out, and we're not alone. It's not like we invented the field by any stretch. Mm -hmm. There's a tremendous amount of work being done to put the skills into people's hands and into their lives uh, to engage in a stressful experience or time or wave and to, instead of doing what might be in, uh, the knee-jerk reaction is to, you know, kind of tighten up and muscle through and override some more and produce the result and so on. <clears throat> but um, the best that those strategies or those reactions can offer us is survival or, again, kind of enduring. It's a sense that we can endure. Yeah. We'll get through it together. But the the notion of resilience is a set of practices, a set of you know kind of awarenesses of how we work individually and together. That if we do these practices and integrate them in the middle of a stressful time, it actually shifts our attention, shifts our openness to be open to the possibility of not just enduring or surviving, but actually learning or expanding, or possibly even thriving. And that's, to me, that's a mind-blowing notion. And it's a, it's a heck of a promise for a you know body of work. But as far as I can tell, there is no better promise of work or no better intent to have in one's life right now than to build out these skills. You know, including things like uh, our capacity to, to grieve, to know what it is to include grief and loss in our experience in a healthy way. That's a huge component that the, if we're good at that, you know, from being quite young all the way to being quite old, if people start to learn about that kind of thing instead of being so damn grief phobic and pain phobic in life as we tend to be in our culture. That's another just extraordinary skill that has me, instead of being exhausted at just trying to survive and muscle through, I have this possibility of cracking open my heart and getting to uh, a remarkable reserve of energy that I'm willing to say is in every one of us. It's the, you know, now we're getting into the zone where I don't know if you've heard of a guy named Andrew Harvey. I think I've heard the name, but I don't know his work. Now, he and Carolyn have written some together, and they've... Oh, that, their, okay, uh, yeah, that's, okay, that's where I recognize the name from, okay. You know, a couple of books I could recommend, you could just, just go read some Andrew Harvey, watch some YouTube videos. He's one of the most passionate experts on the uh, ancient studies of various religions and traditions, and he goes there. He goes there like, these people are no nonsense, these, these folks who have endured like on crosses and being burned at the stake and being vilified in their communities for millennia, they they tapped into something that was big enough to get them through the most extraordinary, you know, hellacious circumstances. And that I call that grace. That's the word I've found, you know, from my own life experiences that have just slammed me open and and all of a sudden, I found myself immersed in this incredible, spacious, actually beautiful energy. And it's it's I don't know what the end of it is. I haven't seen the end of it yet. So that's one aspect 
of this notion of resilience and and taking on these practices that open us up instead of having us contract and in fear or to become more and more isolated. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's that's a start. And so, so these are obviously some of the things that you, you talk about in the second half of your book, which I need, which I say I need to get to myself. So let's talk about, let's plug your uh, upcoming workshops. So I say I'm going to be now. Is this one in Oregon your very first one? Is this your is this your yeah. lead off? All right, yeah. history will be yeah, made. Perfect. So this is Ashland, Oregon, September fifteenth, sixteenth, and seventeenth. Is that correct? That's right. And then we got a second one in October, the 13, 14, 15. That's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday in Boulder, Colorado. And, uh, you know, if people are curious about all this, there are two websites where you can just find a, a bunch of information. And uh, if you go to um, livingresilience.net, that's Carolyn and, and my site that we just put together for our shared body of work. Mm -hmm. And there's a programs link on that site. And if you go there, there's two long old interviews with uh, Janae Donaldson, with Carolyn and myself. And I, I think you'll get just about as much information as, as you could want about the nature of the work. And then there's also a long description of you know written description of the work and, and then the logistics and yeah. and the pricing of it and so on and we're trying to price it as absolutely low as possible you now on a partially gift economy um, scale and what I can tell you is that Carolyn and I are interested in filling these two courses to the just absolutely max because we want to get people in as many communities as we can you know uh, with the seedlings of this information and connected with, with what these practices are. And, um, you know, I go so far as to say if, if you, by the time you read all the, you know, the pricing and the information and logistics of getting there and so on, if you have other questions, please call me and my information is there at, the, at livingresilience.net and the programs page and so on. And my, com my information is there for email and phone and all that. And so if you have a sincere interest in that, even at the reduced price is difficult for you to do it, please just contact me. We want to get people there. Are you, know? you going to have, but besides you and Carolyn, which is, uh, I'm sure all we need, are, are, are there going to be other guests and speakers or not at this no. point? No, there, there won't be any other presenters, um, but we're very excited to have a couple of the folks. You know, this is a massive body of work. This is not just this course and, and a couple of um, slideshows on the website or something. This is this is the biggest body of work I've ever seen, and nobody else is addressing it. Uh, just nobody. You know, for instance, we're, we're looking at completely redesigning and retooling the notion of, of life coaching. Life coaching is, has been a growing field for people to be involved with or, or be customers of for a long time. And we're seeing, I don't know if you've gotten the uh, article uh, that we quote from Lisa Van Susteren in the book where, you know, she estimates in a report that she put together for the World Wildlife Fund that uh, 200 million Americans are anticipated to be suffering from chronic or acute stressors in the coming times in the face of all these predicaments. It's quite a remarkable report. I'd recommend people connect with it. The link is, uh, is both on the website that I just mentioned, and it's also in the book, and it's also Lisa Van Susteren and the World Wildlife Fund, if you want to Google it. Um, what, I'm, what we're hoping to do is, is get as many tools into as many people's hands to be functional with each other um, in a in a way that is nurturing, a way that is supportive, a way that's open-hearted. Again, in the face of you know the massive walls of, of stressors that appear to be on the horizon. 
Is your vi is so you, I, I'm unclear about about your vision for the workshops. Are we talking ten people or fifty? You know, the ideal number for these first two to start out is twenty five in each 25. one. Oh. Which one right now, and so you know, I think we have enough space to be able to accommodate a few more if, if more people want to come in. But that's the, I think the right. I, you know, I've been in the training business a long time, and I, for me, that's the right uh, yeah. amount yeah. of people to start yeah. with. Yeah. Okay. Now you do know that uh, anybody listening that Sancho Panza will be offering a workshop of unbridled joy. <laughs> Of just absolutely <laughs> unbridled love and joy and uh, spreading his uh, goodwill. Uh, so just just to meet Sancho Panza, I think, is uh, and hold him in your lap for a minute right there <laughs> will, uh, will increase your level of optimism. So just just let it, let it, that's at the that's at the Ashland, Oregon one. I don't think we'll be in Colorado. Anyway, so this has been a, I have really enjoyed this conversation. I see we're 45 minutes into it. So let's, uh, well, I want you to stay on the line after we wrap it up and you and, you and I can talk some more. But in closing this uh, official on the record interview, you know, I always just say if there's, if there's anything that, that, that if you could wrap up your message in 90 seconds to anyone listening to this video that you want them to take away from this interview, what would that be? Well, first and foremost, I want to just really thank you for, for all the work you've done for so many years now in getting the message out in your own unique style and way. I, I just think your style is great. It, it communicates to me fully. You inspire me in your work, and I want I want there to be a bunch more voices in their own style out there. And so I just encourage people to take on learning, and starting with the things that you love and what you're concerned about, and do your own kind of expression in the world, uh, whether it's painting or doing a podcast or whatever the heck you do. And I want to invite people to to find a way to expand their tribe, to expand the people that they resonate with and that they can count on and that, that, uh, that they want to support and be with in these, in these trying times ahead, because that's what, that's what really needs to happen right now. And that's certainly what, what my partner and I are doing and Carolyn and I are doing and, and uh, is, is finding our people, finding what we most love in life and being fueled by that. And, uh, I look forward to it. It's, I think it's the most extraordinary time to be alive, and I, and I don't mean to be gruesome, but there's there's this incredible possibility that we could be more fully human in the face of this god awful, you know, predicament. And uh, so I would invite us all to do that because what the hell else are we gonna do? There you go. Uh, exactly. What the hell else are we gonna do? Well, anyway, as so. I think one more time, plug your uh, your website for people who want to uh, to learn yeah. more about you and these workshops and to order your book and all of that stuff. Yeah, well, uh, anybody can go anytime to carolynbaker dot net, and uh, that's her website and all that uh, course information and contact information is there too. Okay. Uh, our shared in, our shared website is livingresilience.net. Live in and resilience dot net. Living resilience. Okay. And then the workshop itself is called Resilience Bridge, meaning we're bridging to a new world that we don't even know what it looks like yet. And then uh, my name's Dean Walker, and I'm at Safe Circle S A F E Safe Circle at Gmail dot com. You know, please feel free to contact me with any questions, and and I just wish all the viewers well, and I uh, wish Sancho Panza well, and and uh, I wonder if you could send me some course information about uh, Pancho's, you know, course. <laughs> oh yeah, well he has his own Facebook page that explains it all. He has uh, all the information <laughs> you need to know is Sancho Panza's Facebook page. Anyway, so guys, we're going to uh, bid farewell to 
Dean Walker at this moment and thank you very much for taking the time and doing what you do to have the impossible conversation and joining us on Humpty Dumpty Tribe today and spreading the word and keep up the good fight and as I say I'll Same to you, Hambone. Much love to you, brother. All right, and I'll be back at you in one minute, but I'm going to say uh, from from me and Sancho Panza and Dean Walker, it's been fun, guys, and get out there and, and enjoy it while you still can, is my parting advice uh, to anyone listening. Bye, guys. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Impossible Conversation podcast, produced by Dean Walker and Living Resilience. Music provided today by Port Blue, Into the Sea. To be considered as a guest on the Impossible Conversation podcast, or to set up coaching, speaking arrangements, workshops, online resilience education, and Resilience Bridge trainings, contact us at livingresilience.earth or impossibleconversation.net, safecircle at gmail.com, or find us on Twitter at safecircle.